We are here to talk about black women in politics. And so I love seeing all of the beautiful black women in the audience today. Thank you so much for joining us. We are going to hop right in and start with just a question for everybody here. Um, in your opinion, when we think about black female representation, are we represented in our politics today? Gabrielle, would you like to start? Thank you for having me. I'm Gabrielle Wyatt. I'm the founder of the Highland Project. And when I think about this question, I actually first think about the women that the Highland Project invests in, the coalition across generations and sectors that we've been investing in since 2020. And when I first look at that question, I say yes, because I think about leaders like Mary Pat Hector, who ran as soon as she could for Atlanta City Council, and now she leads RISE, which is one of the largest national nonprofits focused on students alleviating the unfair student debt that they are carrying. She invested her Highland Project dollars in equity for all to ensure that Gen Z organizers knew that they not just had the power to organize, but they also had the power and the right to run for office. Mm -hmm. And so I think we can sit and look at the national numbers and actually look at national policies, right, and feel the rollback that's actually happening right now. But when I look at the leadership of the Highland Project, I see us represented. I see us exercising our power and our agency. Adrian, do you feel that black women are represented in our politics today? So it's, um, you know, when when you said the question, the first thing I thought is, how, you know, how do we define politics maybe, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that, because I, I know I'm a black woman and I'm not sure, I see myself as being in politics, mm -hmm. right? I think that there's a way in which um, black women participate, um, make significant and huge contributions um, to our communities, um, who see themselves as um, leaders, whether they are you know, uh, working in the schools or they're leading a community group or they're um, you know, uh, engaged in policy. Um, and I'm not sure that people tie that all together and say this is politics, when in fact it really is. Um, and so, you know, I think generally when, when I think about the women that, that we are, you know, working with and encouraging to mobilize their communities um, for elections, there's a lot of women, right? There's a lot of black women. Um, and so I think on that level, yes, right? We, we, um, we will ourselves to engage, right? Um, based on how we see and what we understand to be the needs of our community. When I look at the United States Senate, that's a different story, right? Are we representing the United States Senate? No, we're not, right? And so there's a, you know, when we, when we think about the record numbers of women who have run for office, who are in, um, you know, Congress right now, record numbers of black women, that's a significant um, accomplishment, but there's so much further to go. And we know that having, you know, we, we would hope that we would have two black women in the Senate, you know, come in when we get to 2020 uh, through 2024. Um, but we may not, and we may be um, not represented there, you know, again, we certainly have Senator Butler right now, um, but that's temporary. So um, so when we look across offices, um, there's, there's a lot of work to be done. Mm -hmm. Roxy, I'm, I'm very curious about, as somebody who has run and been elected, what your thoughts are on whether or not black women are represented in our politics. Well, first of all, Cheyenne, let me start by saying thank you so much for extending an invitation to me. Good morning, everyone. My name is Roxy Ndebumadu, and I have the distinct pleasure of being elected to the Bowie City Council in Prince George's County, Maryland, which is the best county, I would have to say, <laughs> in all of America. But I would say my proudest hat is being a Howard University graduate of the School of College of Nursing and Allied Sciences. Yep, yep. Let's give it up for HU. So when you started the question, there were so many things going through my head. I would have to say my answer is no. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you why my answer is no. When I think about politics, as somebody who's been a two-term elected official, I ran the second time in 2023, one of the youngest, one of the youngest women in the state of Maryland, so many things. Politics to me is, de is designed to have power. Mm -hmm. But when I look at black women who are in positions of power, and I mean decision-making power, I don't see very many. So that's why I would say my answer is no, because we have a lot of black women who are defining politics, who are creating movements within politics, who are adjacent to politics. But do we have a lot of black women who actually have decision making power within politics? The answer is no. So I would have to say by my definition, as somebody who is sitting at that table, 
who is creating legislation, who has the responsibility of looking after a community of 70,000 people, one of the fastest growing in the state of Maryland, I would definitely define that as no. Mm -hmm. Not yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I want to stick with you for one moment, Roxy, as being somebody who is elected as representing the Republican Party right now, um, looking out at this beautiful young crowd right here, with that in mind that we are not represented at the decision-making table, can you just talk a little bit about how you, you got to that table mm -hmm. to be able to sit there and say, I'm going to be part of these decisions? Wow, I can't say that I woke up and that was my thought <laughs> <laughs> one day, and it's crazy. So let me take a step back. This morning when I was getting dressed, I put on my class ring and I almost like wanted to go into tears because it wasn't so long ago that I was sitting right here in the same very seat back in 2016 before I walked across the stage. And when I drove around campus looking for parking, we'll be talking to Muriel Browser. <laughs> Sometimes we speak about this. I said to myself, wow, it feels like yesterday. I was just right here. I didn't wake up walking the streets of Howard University saying I'm going to run for office, saying I'm going to have a seat at the table. That wasn't my story. I knew that I was going to get a job. I was going to provide for my family. I was going to do all these great things. Maybe have the opportunity to go to Europe and go on vacation and finally learn what vacation actually meant. And then I got to Microsoft after college. And Microsoft was amazing. I was in big tech. But even being in big tech, less than 3% were black women in big tech. Mm -hmm. And I looked around and I said, wow, we have so much power. We're designing all these products that people are using. But there's less than 3% black mm -hmm. women in the room making the products. That's a problem for me. So one day I was sitting in a room, and I will always, always give this man the highest honor because he changed the trajectory of my career, Fred Humphreys. He said, you should maybe run for office. And I was like, Fred, have you met me? Like, <laughs> what is going on here? No, I should not. He said, Roxy, you should run for office. And I said, hmm. I respected Fred, very prominent government affairs professional, knows a lot of people, seen a lot. So I said, maybe I should. So I looked into running for elected office. It was about 45 days before the city council election. I said, you know what, why not? If I don't tell my story, who's going to tell it? If I don't represent my people, who's going to represent my people? And I ran for office. I wasn't very active in politics. I wasn't very active in a party. I just knew that I grew up in a community. I was passionate about that community. I saw what happened to my community when certain people got into power, felt like the community was going in a different direction. And I said, if not me, then who? Mm -hmm. And so I ran. And then I won. And I became the first African-American woman to represent my district. And let me tell you the power in that and why this is so important. First of all, I won by 16 votes. Mm -hmm. So every vote matters. Mm -hmm. 16 votes. So if 16 people woke up that morning and said, you know what, I'm not going to go vote today because my vote doesn't matter. I wouldn't be sitting on the stage. I wouldn't be in the room at all. And by right, you wouldn't be in the room because I'm not in the room. So let's start there. Then let's take that a step further. After winning by 16 votes, after becoming one of the youngest, then I started to engage with the party a little bit more. And I was like, hmm, that's a little interesting. <laughs> but what I learned was, I can't expect you to legislate an experience that you don't understand and you don't have. This is my lived experience. This is my community's lived experience. You can sympathize. Maybe you might be able to empathize one day. But what you won't be able to do is adequately resent, represent me and my community because you don't have that experience. And so I became that voice in the party. And they embraced me because I was unapologetic about representing my community and my lived experience. But by representing my lived experience and my community's lived experience, that didn't negate theirs. It didn't mean that theirs was any less important than the lived experience of my community. But I knew that my community's experience had to be in the room mm -hmm. in order for decisions to be made and policies to be changed. Mm -hmm. Roxy, thank you so much for sharing that. I, I want to pivot just a touch to, to you, Gabrielle, when we think about the Highlands, pro the Highland Project's mission of helping invest, sustain women in leadership roles. 
listening to Roxy's story, how do you see us collectively ensuring that not just she in her position, but other women are able to seek out that position and say, without somebody else coming up to them and saying, oh yeah, you should run. How do we just instill that in women naturally? I think a couple of things. I think one, the power already is in us mm -hmm. as black women and girls. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a household on the better side of the Beltway in Baltimore, and it was a household of educators, youngest of three. And I knew growing up because of my parents that I was brilliant and that I was mm -hmm. powerful. And it's also true that the headwinds of over 400 years of structural racism continue to blow strong. They continue to try to blow us down. Mm -hmm. And I have a similar story of an educator seeing in me that I should run for school board at age 17, and that's what I did, and I earned my seat. But fast forward to the Highland Project, and I think for us what we care deeply about is creating a circle that is truly intergenerational mm -hmm. to pass on this power that lives within us. So often when I was in leadership roles in public service, there were never intergenerational tables. Mm -hmm. At best, they might have been two generation, mm -hmm. but we never were sitting with someone two generations behind us mm -hmm. and two generations ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And I think when we're not sitting together, we lose our stories. Mm -hmm. We lose the stories of Roxy's power. We lose what it's like to sit as a black woman as the only and have to carry on mm -hmm. despite the forces trying to push us out of the seat. We're mm -hmm. talking a lot about getting into the seat, mm -hmm. but what does it mean if we don't get there, mm -hmm. one? Two, what does it mean when we're there? How do we sustain ourselves through it? And three, what does it mean on the other side? What's our responsibility for continuing to cultivate a bench of leadership mm -hmm. around us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Adrian, you and I have talked extensively about particularly black voters. So I want to pivot just a little bit because Roxy said something about when, when she saw a certain leadership in her community, she felt there was changes happening in her community. What are some of the things that black pack are hearing as what black women especially want, want to see, not just going into 2024, but sort of from, from all of our elected leaders right now? Mm -hmm. So I think that we all can, um, relate to what we've been hearing from folks and we've been doing a lot of um, focus groups around the country um, over the last six months or so um, and I think that the one thing that stands out because we hear it all the time we see it in our own you know neighborhoods we see it in our own families is that there's just a lot of anxiety right mm -hmm. now um, people are very worried they're very concerned um, and there's a, a list of reasons that I'll, I'll touch on um, a couple um, that are, you know, about the, the issues that, that people care about, that you then add a national election mm -hmm. on top of that, um, and people, and, and you add, you know, sort of the, you know, we all sort of have pushed the COVID era aside, mm -hmm. um, but the reality is that people are still struggling coming out of that period. Um, and so, um, so there's a lot of anxiety right now. Um, you know, folks also, I think we oftentimes hear a lot about apathy in our community and that, mm. um, you know, people don't want to get involved and that they, that they don't want to vote. We don't actually experience that mm. as a reality. Um, and whether that is when we're knocking on doors and talking to people or when we have people in focus groups, people really do want to be involved. Mm -hmm. They really do care. They really do want to make sure that they are, you know, making a positive contribution however they can. There's a lot of things about politics that people just don't understand, right? Um, there's, and we talk about civics all the time, and we need to increase our, you know, our knowledge of, of civics and how our government works and how our elections work. And that's all true. And the challenge is that when people don't have that information, they feel disempowered, mm -hmm. right? And so they, I often you know, say to folks that we need to really um, you know, not use the word apathetic mm -hmm. so much because really we need to be finding grace for people mm -hmm. who step out or remove themselves from our politics or from our, our electoral process um, because they don't have the information, mm -hmm. right? And it's our responsibility, right, to get people the information um, because people feel not just, um, not just disempowered 
there's a lot of shame, frankly, right? Mm -hmm. When we're in focus groups and people don't know the answers, their first reaction is, well, it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. right? Or, oh, well, I'm not going to vote because it doesn't matter. And then when you dig underneath that, what it really is is people are embarrassed mm -hmm. that they don't understand that they don't know all the things, right? And there's a sense that they're gonna be judged for it, right? And so we need to offer uh, black women grace and not make assumptions about what people do and don't know. But there's a lot of anxiety right now. And we always think that, you know, oftentimes, and say we always, but we oftentimes think that when people say that they're not happy about the direction of the country, we assume that that's mostly about the economy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We assume that it's because people, you know, are feeling the pressure of the economic conditions. Um, and that's true. Right. That is there is a lot of anxiety around the economy right now. But there's a whole host of issues that, that black women are concerned about right now. K through 12 education. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, black uh, maternal health and women's and other women's health issues. Right. Concerned about the cost of health care, concerned about um, the um, uh, college affordability. Right. Concerned mm -hmm. about racism uh, and white supremacy. So there's a whole gun violence, a whole host of issues that black women care about. All of those things right now, in some way, are really significant or under assault, mm -hmm. right? The right to vote is always a top issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you, when you look at all of these issues that are top of mind um, for, for black women right now, and we look at the ways that all of those issues are under duress, um, and we can see and we get the picture of why people say things are not going great. Mm -hmm. And it's not just because of the economy. Mm -hmm. it's, it's part, that's part of it. But there are a whole host of other issues. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you know, part of our role at, at Black Pack and many organizations like ours really is to make sure that we are providing information for people, that we're actually having the, we're talking this stuff through with mm -hmm. people, mm -hmm. right? Like we're helping people to understand um, not just the importance of elections, but the, the importance of their participation, mm -hmm. right? And the power that they do have, mm -hmm. right? And we talk a lot about power because people feel powerless, right? Mm -hmm. in, in When they have the sense of anxiety, they have a sense of powerlessness. And so we talk with people about what our power can do. We talk about history, mm -hmm. right? We talk about the, our struggle to become, to, you know, sort of have full citizenship um, in this country. And we mm -hmm. talk about, you know, the path, right, uh, uh, that, our, that our ancestors took, mm -hmm. right, to get us to the place where we are are now and what does that mean in terms of responsibility so we try and do education with people mm -hmm. that really is about bringing people to the point where they feel like they can exercise their own power and they understand the importance and significance of it so that people feel like they have control yeah right that they have some control over their own lives they have control over over politics even when they say oh no I don't do politics mm. right politics I don't do that um, <laughs> you know we talk about what that what that well, what does that really mean right so um, so there's a lot of anxiety and there's a lot of stress but there's also a lot of hope I would mm. say and people People really do again there is a sense that I know I have to do something I know I have to participate and the one thing that I can do collectively with my community because voting in a way is a is a is a community action mm -hmm. right for our community is a way in which in some in some moments with that we show actual resistance right mm -hmm. is by showing up um, and voting and people are feeling that in a, mm -hmm. in a really intense way right now mm -hmm. Kimberly, hi, how are you? Good morning, I'm doing good, how are you? Good morning, I'm so happy that you're here with us today. Um, we are talking about the power of black women at this moment, and I love it. Um, and you, um, as Roxy, um, are currently running. Um, and a reminder, we're not, this is not a campaign stump at all, promise y'all. Um, but with that, you are bringing um, a very unique experience to us today. And so I wanna take a moment to acknowledge um, what some of the barriers you think are facing black women from seeking out office right now? Oh, wow. Well, that's a good question. I think women in general, I mean, the political arena is really a male dominant world. Mm. And so for women in general, I think it's very difficult. Uh, I think sometimes uh, as a black woman, sometimes you're kind of looked at as you're not taken so seriously. Mm. Uh, I, feel, I definitely feel that in many rooms. Uh, but you know, you can always prove yourself and show what your worth is. Uh, before running for office, I ran a nonprofit. We did workforce development, mm. helped women become financially independent. And I think when you just share exactly what your experience is and what qualifies you for the position, people really then begin to take you seriously. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we try to do all the time. Yeah, yeah, and we spoke with Roxy a little bit earlier about sort of what inspired her to run. And I'm hoping you can share with our audience today what inspired you to say, I wanna be in the room making the decisions. 
Well, I don't know if everybody knows, but I'm from the Baltimore area, and so we have a lot going on politically. Um, unfortunately, even when I was running my nonprofit, we would come up a lot of, against a lot of barriers uh, mm -hmm. for the women, uh, and most of it came from the career development centers that were connected with the mayor's office or city hall in general. And so what we, I, I noticed was we could do more to help but they weren't really making and pulling those punches, right? It was just, we were always coming up to a roadblock or some kind of obstacle. Uh, so I said, you know what, I think if we were on the other side and really try to get these women to be independent, get them what they need, their resources, uh, I think we could move forward. Um, I felt as though, unfortunately, in some of these cases, when you have um, maybe the career center or the nonprofits doing these work, this work, uh, I think sometimes they feel as though if the work's not there, they might not have a job. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like job security to continue it and maybe slow down the process. When I thought, you know what, these women can't wait another day. Mm -hmm. uh, these women have things to do, bills to pay and families and mouths to feed. So I just thought, you know what, let's, let's get in there and, and really you know, push and strive uh, to make this work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, um, you are all incredibly powerful black women in this moment, but we have a room right now of so many black women, and I know there are others here who might not identify as a w woman, um, but I want to take a moment to turn it over to our audience to ask these three one, two, three, four, I can count. <laughs> this is why I'm not a math person. Our four beautiful panelists, if they have any questions. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I didn't know how loud this was going to be. Um, I am Amber Dodd. I am the associate editor of the university. I also am the associate editor of Howard Magazine as well. Um, my question today is, because we are producing a election story within our upcoming magazine for spring summer, um, do you think that the mistrust of black voters or young black voters, voters is well earned, um, especially in the day and age where uh, the seniors of Howard are the people who missed out on their freshman year. You know, 2020 was COVID time, and we've seen the political, the tumultuous political environment. So I'm wondering, um, do you feel that young voters have um, earned their mistrust with the political um, atmosphere that we're seeing today? Thank you. I can start. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of mistrust in general <laughs> across across the board, regardless of you know age demographic. Um, you know, I think that so I would say um, the younger generation, and I think that when I was talking about the the issues and the sort of anxiety that um, that is that is felt um, when we're talking with with voters, um, I I would say that there is the intensity of that is felt. Um, most by younger people, mm -hmm. right? Um, and I think that there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of issues The you know, the sort of uh, list of issues that I talked about um, are, um, those are, you know, what we would say in our, you know, when we're doing research, those are, those are top box issues um, for young people. Um, and they don't see, and you all don't see oftentimes progress being made on those issues or you're seeing rights being rolled back right right before our very eyes um and so there's a reason to say well what what is this all about right why, why am i showing up right there's a, we expect a transaction in some ways in our in our politics mm -hmm. we show up we vote um, we tell you ahead of time what we want you to to do, right? The issues we want you to to um, to work on, the policies we want you to fix. We give you you say I'll do those things. We give you our vote, and then there isn't progress or things get rolled back. Um, there's also a lot of you know sort of when we think about um, you know the sort of top issues, whether it's gun violence or um, or you know abortion rights. Um, you have, you know, obviously uh, uh, this expectation <laughs> that, uh, that policies and laws will, will pass that make things better, um, whether it's on, you know, sort of the gun violence front or it's on um, women's reproductive um, health. And so I think that, um, that yes, it's, it's warranted because we have, again, there's pro we want to see progress. I think there's, we have to understand that, um, uh, you know, uh, things take time. 
right? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm now that old lady who says that, right? <laughs> like, things take time and we have to wait. Um, but some of that, though, I think is also about the, the thing I said earlier about making sure that we all understand actually how things get done, mm -hmm. right? Where the interventions can happen, right? To speed things up, mm -hmm. right? Or to disrupt them, right? And so I think that that's also part of, you know, the, both the expectation that we all should have of ourselves when we, when we decide that this is going to be our work, um, that we have to help educate people on what the process is, where the intervention points are, and how we organize the power that's necessary to be able to intervene, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, that that is uh, an important part of helping to, um, to heal, right, the, the distrust and the mistrust um, that many people in our community have of our political process. Can I just add yeah. real fast that at Highland, we've developed one of the largest national polls of black women registered to vote with our partner, Cornell Belcher. And over the last three years, we've seen the consistent rise in dissatisfaction mm -hmm. among Gen Z and millennial voters. And so I just want to reiterate what Adrian said, of like, we're not here to judge is it earned or not. Like, you're naming this as your lived experience. Where I frankly get nervous as a black woman for our community as a whole is that when we looked at the data this past summer, it was over one in five black women across all generations that we polled said that they were undecided or not supportive of the political candidate who was likely to run for president. Mm -hmm. My hope is that that does not turn into not showing up, the, up at the voting booth. It has to show up at the voting booth, but I think what you're hearing from Adrian as well is we have to do more. Mm -hmm. It's whether you see yourself in running for political office, whether you see yourself being a chief of staff to the future Roxy, whether you <laughs> see yourself in philanthropy moving the important dollars that are necessary to sustain movements. It's not, it's not enough to vote. It's an important mm -hmm. first step, mm -hmm. but I think we have to see the sustained action through. Mm -hmm. And my question to you all, it's to myself every day is, what are we fighting for? Mm -hmm. What are we fighting for? And what's the one or two actions that we're going to take, not just between now and November, but on the other side of November to pursue that future? And, and I want to turn it over very quickly to um, Roxy and Kimberly and extrapolate a little bit on that question and say, with that mistrust, which we know is there, how does that affect the way that you're talking to these young voters in your communities to tell them, not maybe not you don't have to trust me but to know like we hear you we hear that distrust and we know perhaps it is rightfully earned mm -hmm. okay I, I i will say that i think there might be a lot of mistrust uh because of the media um, mm -hmm. I'm one of those people, look, I ran in 2020. Uh, I believe we had a successful run as far as getting our name out there and name ID. Uh, we had the most watched campaign ad in history, uh, but even in black spaces, nobody really acknowledged that. And I think sometimes when you're black and a Republican, uh, sometimes you are looked down upon or at differently by other black people, which I don't think is helpful, honestly. And so for me, I would think that if we could come together and just know, look, if you really want somebody at the table, uh, you need to have people on both sides, right? Because when you have the Republicans that have the majority in the House and say we have the majority in the Senate and say that Trump's in office, you still want black people at the table, right? So you can't just push people away because they're on the other side of the aisle. I think sometimes that mistrust is there. And I would say that, you know, with your own very eyes, you're not stupid. You see what's going on. Uh, but then you hear a different story from the media and you're kind of looking at it like, wow, I'm watching this real, you know, live in time on Instagram and they're telling me a different story, but you know the truth. You know, it's like, what are you gonna believe, your lying eyes? And so I think we have to really just uh, remember that not everybody has the same ideas and policies, but we all wanna get there into the same place, right? We all want public safety. We all want a good education system. We don't wanna pay, you know, $8 for a carton of eggs, right? We yeah. all want the same things, uh, but there's different ways to go about it. And I think sometimes when you, when you shun some people because they're on, some different side of the aisle or a different viewpoint, I think sometimes that hurts us as a whole uh, as far as the community. I think there's two things that I have to start off with saying. One thing that I need people to realize that Kim touched on. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Mm -hmm. I just need you to understand that. That's just it and that's all. Mm -hmm. The second thing is when people show you who they are, believe them mm -hmm. the first time, not the second, third or fourth or fifth or sixth, <laughs> the first time. And I feel like there have been a lot of elected leaders who have shown the community who they are, but yet for some reason, we don't wanna believe them for whatever reason. And so I think it's both sides. And I could say this 
confidently because I'm a millennial. I'm 30 years old. I just turned 30 last year. And so I think for me, what, what was so interesting about my race and talking to voters and, and getting people to vote for you, because understand that one of the most intimate things you can ever do is cast a vote. It is a very intimate experience. And to convince people that you are the leader of their lifetime is a very powerful thing. For me, as a Republican woman, black woman, who represents an 89% Democrat area, 89%, I need you guys to understand, it's very historic and it's very unusual. In our campaign was all ran by all black women, my campaign specifically. Only one of them was Republican because I don't believe in siloed success. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in, oh, I'm only Republican, so I can't talk to Democrats, to Democrats, to this and that, that, that. that. Because at the end of the day, like Kim said, we all want to get to the same destination. But people also have to understand that with the democratization of information, it has made it very difficult to suss out what's real and what's not real, especially with the rise of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. deep fakes, things of that sort. So now we're talking about having the agency to be able to delineate between what's real and what's not real, and really doing that due diligence and having that opportunity to understand how is this person going to show up for me? Because the concept of servant leadership is something that's real, but it's no longer real in our politics, unfortunately. And so to answer your question, is the mistrust earned? I think it's on both sides. It's not just on the millennials and the Gen Zs. It's not just on the elected leaders. It's on both sides because many elected leaders have showed you who they are. Nobody wants to believe them for whatever reason. And so there's a thing of insanity and expecting different results not coming. But then there's also this thing of you owe it to yourself and you deserve to have that representation in every room, at every table, on every side. Because like I said in the beginning, if you're not at the table, you are on the menu. And I see that so distinctly clear by being the only Republican on a body of seven elected bot individuals and really being in those rooms and having a gentleman who's not saying, why am I gonna raise taxes in an election year? I'm gonna just wait and run for re-election and raise taxes after the election. I hear those conversations. I hear them so clearly. But again, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And fortunately for my community, I'm at the table. Thank y'all so much. Yes, and I just wanna echo that sentiment. Thank you, Gabrielle, Adrian, Roxy, Kimberly. You have all been absolutely incredible. We're so appreciative of you for taking this time today. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.